information center. So I'm glad to see so many of you guys here coming out to learn more about SEO. Can you guys hear me okay in the back? Yep. Okay, they don't have a very loud voice, but I will try to keep um, projecting. Okay, so this is me. Um, my professional photos are really out of date, so this is a photo from last month when I was in DC. Uh, my name is Kristen Hussimanen. Um, I actually said how it's spelled. Um, I have an agency called Satin Web Solutions. We do web design and development, content marketing, SEO, social media marketing, and um, website maintenance. On. Um, so what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to give just a quick overview of SEO with a little bit of history thrown in, go over on-page best practices pretty quickly because Anthea has a case study and she's going to go into those I think in a little bit more detail, and just kind of an overview of what's new in SEO and the steps that you should be taking in 2019 and beyond. So first of all, what is search engine optimization? Um, SEO obviously stands for search engine optimization, and that can really be a very broad range of things. It can be anything that will increase the quantity and quality of the web traffic, the traffic that you're getting coming to your website. So some of that is on your website. There's also a lot of factors off of your website, and external or off-page SEO factors that will influence that. So what is Google looking for, and why am I specifically talking about Google? I'm going to start out with why Google. Um, I used to give these talks a lot more often when I was earlier on in my business, and I don't know, between seven to nine years ago. And back then, I used to still, even back then, I focused primarily on what was good for Google. And I used to say at these talks that Google's market share in search was approaching 70%. So Google's business model is based on advertising. If they have a higher market share in search, then they can sell more ads. Right? So Google's goal really is for the users to have a good experience and to find what they want so that everybody will use Google when they're doing their searching. So now, as Google search market share increases, they can increase their ad sales, and they've been doing that a lot. And now, just in the United States, they're at 88.7 percent of the market share. This is April 2019, so it's a very recent statistic. Globally, it was 92 percent. So that's why I primarily focus on Google, Google's algorithms, what we can do to help websites come up higher and generate more traffic in, you know, in Google. And then usually the other search engines, if you do all the right things for Google, you're going to do pretty well in the other search engines. But if you get to a point where you kind of felt like you've done all the things that you can, that, then you can kind of go and look more specifically at being maybe in and say, okay, what else can I do that would just tweak it a little bit more for me? So, but primarily, you know, Google is going to be your vast percentage of your traffic. So, what is Google looking for? Um, there are thousands of um, ranking factors in Google's algorithms, but they generally tend to fall within these categories. Popularity was the original basis of Google. When they first started, they wanted to find a way to rank which websites you know, would come up higher in search. And that's where they created the idea of a link being a vote for your website. And they thought, well, the most popular websites must be popular for a reason. They have some kind of value to offer. And that was the beginning of how Google was able to deliver better results than the other search engines. That has certainly developed complexity. There's been, over the years, um, people have figured out how to game the system. And it's been a constant battle between people trying to, SEOs trying to game the system and Google trying to fight back and say, how else can we determine what's the best search result for the user? So that goes into relevance. Um, they want to make sure that your content is relevant. You know, back in the day, people would just put a bunch of keywords in the meta keyword field, and they would just go by that. Um, that obviously doesn't work anymore. Most search engines don't look at the keyword field at all anymore. Um, so they've gotten really advanced with semantics. You don't necessarily need to use just one single keyword everywhere. They can understand the keywords around that, you know, the other words around that, phrases, long tail keywords, the overall meaning of your content. Uh, authority, um, I'm gonna get into that a little bit more later, but just that you have a uh, authoritative website, you always rank higher, that goes into domain age, um, reputation, um, things that show that you are an authority in your industry. Um, freshness, that 
is related to that's something that's come up more recently, probably you know, at least the last you know five to ten years, I guess, has become more and more important, uh, especially as our websites have become more dynamic with blogging and interactive content. If you have a website that's static and nothing changes on it, you're gonna lose your Google um, you know, present because they're really looking for freshness. When people are searching for content, they want recent content. They want to know that it's up to date. And so Google definitely looks at that. User experience. So this kind of goes back to Google's foundation of they want users to have a good experience so that people will continue to do all their searching on Google and they can sell more ads. So that's kind of you know a simplistic way of looking at it. But their algorithms have developed more and more so that they can assess user experience. Um, and there's, we'll get into a couple different ways that they do that later on. So when we talk about SEO best practices, um, these are all the, the basic things that everybody should be doing on their website. And um, you know, when I started out, I think it was in my um, description on the, the meetup group, when I first started doing web design, I was with, you know, I had started out doing SEO before I started doing web design, and so I would build SEO into everything that I did, and that really set me apart, because most web designers didn't know anything about SEO, you know, 10 years ago. But now it's become expected. It's common practice that the, the basic, you know, foundations of SEO should be built into every website. And then people who are professionals in SEO can go above and beyond into more advanced factors. So we're trying to give <coughs> all users the best possible experience. And so that means any age, any device, any connection speed. So this kind of relates to the talk last month on accessibility, um, and that relates to, you know, comes back to the user experience. So um, our job, in addition to giving them a good experience, is to make sure that Google and the users know what our website is about. So that's where it comes down into the actual SEO techniques that you use help tell Google and tell your users what your website is about, what each page is about, so that they can make sure that it is relevant for the searches that they'll um, you know, have it come up for. So this is going to be a checklist of just kind of on-page best practices. I'm going to try not to go into each one very much. Um, okay, so do your keyword research. But again, go into phrases and long-term, long-tail keywords. It doesn't have to be just one single keyword anymore. And you can use synonyms within your content and things like that because Google will recognize that. Um, use human readable title tags with keywords. So when you look at a search result, and I think Anthea has some samples of her um, slides, the first blue text that you see that's clickable, that comes from your title tag. It's also what shows up in a little tab in your browser. That is a really critical piece for SEO. You want your title tag to tell what your site is about but you don't want it to look like your keyword stuff, you just throwing a bunch of you know, synonyms or something in there. You want it to look you know, user friendly. Um, the meta description is not used as much as a ranking factor, but it shows up in the search result page right underneath your title tag. And so that's why I kind of describe it to people as almost like a call to action. That's where you're putting something descriptive, something that's going to entice the person when they see your impression on the Google search result page to click on your link to show them that this is the page, this is the one I want to click on, this is where I want to go. This has the information that I'm looking for. So H1 tags, you want one H1 tag per page and using your headers semantically. Again, that came up in the accessibility talk last week that header tags are not intended to be a stylistic feature, they're intended to be a semantic feature. So you should have them sequentially, H1, H2, H3, another section can start again with H2, you know, kind of H3 going down like that. And then style them accordingly, rather than style them first and just using where the style fits. Using short, meaningful URLs, they're descriptive of your page. Linking internally. Um, to all of your pages. And this is something that gets a little trickier when we get into mobile um, development and how your mobile website works because you have less um, real estate on the page. But you don't want to make um, users or Google search um, crawlers go too deeply to find your pages. <coughs> you want to make everything accessible within three clicks, ideally, not too much cheaper than that if you have a couple pages that might that need to go deeper. But really trying to make everything 
easy to get to within three clicks. Use meaningful keywords in your image file names and descriptions. And sometimes that'll help. It won't always help with your website itself command and search, but it'll help your images come up in image search. is where it has this larger impact, but still always best practice to have this in there for accessibility as well. Um, this is a newer one and very important, using it SSL so that your website serves up on HTTPS. If you don't have your site on HTTPS with SSL certificate, you're going to get penalized. You're going to get almost knocked out of search engines. And you're going to get little warnings that show up in your browser when your users go to the site that says not secure. So that's not only um, you know, having it installed, but actually going through and making sure that all of your links to all of your elements um, you know, have secure links and going to them. You'll see sometimes a little, uh, I think we have an example of this, but um, you'll say some elements on this site are not secure. And there's a website called uh, whynopadlock.com that you can go to to try and find out. Usually it's a link to an image or some internal link that you've added in a widget. You might have typed in the link manually. And so you still have a link that actually says HTTP, you know, colon, da, da, da. And fixing all those little links within your site to make sure they all use HTTPS. What's the name of it? Whynopadlock.com. Why no? Why, like W-H-Y. No, padlock.com. What I do is I usually just look at the source code and I do a search in my browser for HTTP colon, and that'll find me also. Okay, use mobile responsive design. Um, that's another thing that Google has pretty much shifted over. If your site is not mobile compatible, then it's not going to come up well in the search engines. And it doesn't just mean that your site can come up. There's people, you know, I've had clients who are like, well, I can pull up my site on, you know, a mobile phone, but you still see the sidebar on the side, everything has to get smaller and smaller to be able to see it. You know, that's, and it doesn't necessarily have, like, the mobile tags in the um, header that the browser is looking for, that Google is looking for. So you actually want mobile responsive design, where usually your sidebar content is going to fall drop down below, Text is going to be sized appropriately so that people don't have to be sitting there like scrolling in and out and you know, in and out to see your content. So mobile responsive design is super important. Um, and then content. Content is huge. And that's what Anthony is going to talk about. Content, content, content. You want to be adding new content. You want to have lots of really valuable, unique, useful, informative, interesting content on your website. OK. So the. Um, Search landscape and trade. Yes. So what happens when you have pop-ups on the home page? Like you know, for email, send it to newsletter, things like that. Does that an address you? So if you have a pop-up on your website, like sign up for a newsletter or something like that? Correct. Um, you know, I haven't done too much recent research on that, but I don't think it's that big of a, a negative, as long as you don't have like a huge, like a completely blank, like loading page or something, you know what I mean? Like there used to be those splash pages that had nothing on them. Mm -hmm or they had animations that were flash. Like those are really bad, but just the pop-up, and especially if it's delayed, um, after people have been on there. Um, you know, again, I haven't looked at the stats on that, the research on it super recently, but I don't think it's a real big deal. So, um, often the pop-up, like plugins and WordPress, will have something where it disables it on mobile, because what will happen is if somebody's on their cell phone, it covers up like the whole screen, right? And it becomes a usability issue. So. If it impacts people's usability and they see that pop-up before they can even see the content that they want to come for, and they're going to just click the back button because it's annoying, then that's going to show through. It's going to be issues. So search landscape is changing. You know, we've always been um, focused on desktop, on computers. And traditionally, that's what you know you had to worry about. <coughs> um, now, we have mobile. We have voice search. So there's a lot of new things on the landscape, and you know that impacts what we want to do on our websites to make sure that it's still a good user experience for everybody, and that we're still getting traffic. So this is a statistic that um, in the United States, um, it's kind of holding steady now that around 40% of all searches are done on mobile devices. Um, Globally, that's a higher number because there's a lot of countries, and India is a really good example um, where they've kind of bypassed. You know, people didn't get, you know, never had like computers in all the homes, but they all had cell phones before they had computers. So, you know, 
works that way with like telecommunications too. A lot of places never had landline phones and they just jumped out on cell phones. And so they've kind of leapfrogged that step and all of the browsing or very high percentages of it are on mobile. So if you have a business that targets, you know, any you know international um, audience, that's something to keep in mind. Okay. New search factors in 2019. So mobile first indexing. Now I talked about mobile, but um, if you guys have heard of mobile first, what that means is Google is actually crawling your mobile site before they're crawling your desktop site. So if you don't have content, you know, at first when we started converting to mobile, some people had a separate site for mobile than they had for the desktop. Uh, or sometimes, you know, you're hiding links or you're hiding pages on your mobile um, version of your website to try and make it cleaner and more simple and, you know, more user-friendly on a phone. Um, however, those links and those pages, if, you, if they're not accessible on your mobile device, your mobile version of your website, they're not going to come up in search anymore. So Google's making this announcement through your Google Search Console, and um, it's one thing everybody should have, you know, things like Google Analytics, Google Search Console, um, you know, set up on their website. But if you go into your Google Search Console, it'll give you a notification and tell you if your site has been transitioned to mobile first indexing. And so I think they are trying to you know, they started out with the sites that worked well on mobile and were looked like they were ready for mobile first indexing, but they're rolling it out to everybody. So um, if you haven't done that, if you don't have your website using responsive design with the same site and just format and style differently for CSS, um, then that's something you really want to look at doing. And now we're even moving towards mobile first design where you're designing for the mobile site and then you're starting for the desktop site. It's sort of the reverse. So that's kind of where the trend is going. Um, answering questions with voice search, with all the home speaker devices, um, with the Google the featured snippets on the Google search results page, answering questions is a big piece of search. People, you know, you used to have to just type in keywords and now people are just asking full questions and Google's understanding them. Um, so you know, look at that with your content. Um, search intent. So if somebody does a search for, um, you know, how do I paint my living room versus somebody does a search for house painters, okay? Google is understanding that one of them wants to have two information, so they're more likely to get a video, blog post, information that's going to show them how to do it themselves. The other one, they're going to get you know, listings on, you know, trade websites and Yelp and Angie's List. They're going to, um, you know, get the listings, Google local listings of house painters. They're going to get the local search path, things like that. So intent is um, being recognized. And if you've done your keyword research and you have a keyword that you want to use, you know, always type it into Google and see what's coming up. And you may have thought of that keyword a different way than other people are thinking of it. So that's another part of keyword research. If you see, if you were thinking of something that you want to sell, and you see a bunch of um, posts coming up that are all about how-tos, maybe your phrasing isn't quite what you want it to be. And you want to you know, take another look at that and make sure your phrasing it, your keywords that you're targeting, your long tail phrases that you're targeting are in line with the intent of your page. So featured snippets, um, again, they're taking up more and more real estate on the search result page. So, you know, then there's a whole new aspect how do you get yourself into those featured snippets? So there's the local search path if you're a local brick and mortar business. Um, there's a lot of things you can do to get into that. There's the um, you know questions and answers. Um, there's a lot of different things. You know, depending on the industry, you know, you do a search and you'll see what's taking up the real estate. And so that's something else we need to be thinking about. So the um, search are becoming more and more interactive. Things like they have a little box that says people always also ask, and it gets people going to more and more questions within the page instead of clicking, you know, within the search result page without clicking through to a website. Um, if you search for flights, you know, Google's pulling them, you know, it used to be you pick your choice if you want to go to Expedia or Kayak or whatever, and you still can go directly to those sites, but if you start out searching a flight on Google, it's going to pull up all the sites itself and give you all the flight information. Jobs, it does the same thing. There's lots of different areas now where it's pulling that information in and it's providing it right there on the Google property. 
So again, that's just something to be aware of. And you know, how are you going to respond and try to stay ahead of the curve in your industry? And how Google's reacting? So, um, yeah, just on that same topic, they're going to continue to develop ways, it's in their best interest <coughs> to keep people on their pages longer. So keeping your eye out for that and just kind of like thinking about, you know, what are you going to do to adapt. Uh, video is going to continue to dominate, especially in the how-to market. So that's one of the big things. The video is performing better, you know, still performing better than almost all the other content, um, even when you look at like advertising and, you know, <coughs> Video ads are the ones that are performing the best, so people really like the video content. Okay, so let me just touch a little bit on local SEO, um, and this applies, you know, more if you have a brick and mortar business, and so people have blog sites or online businesses. It depends on where you're at, but um, all the organic desktop factors still apply in local search. Um, so if you rank well in organic, just because you're doing local and you want to be in the local search pack and you're doing some things all related to local, that doesn't mean to ignore the standard you know, best practices for your website because you need all those things also. So you still need all of the regular rank detectors that you would see in a regular organic search in addition to the local indicators. Google My Business um, is essential. You've got to make sure you have the claim, you have it updated, you have your hours correct. They have a feature when there's holidays that you can go in and put special hours when you're going to be closed. It's super frustrating for people when they look up a restaurant and they check, oh, are they still open? And you drive over there, oh, they're closed. But it said on Google they were open. So people have come to expect that and depend on it. So if you have a brick and mortar business, make sure all that information is up to date. Um, <coughs> Google will also look at this as far as you know your search ranking in the local pack. Is all your information complete? Have you added pictures? Have you yeah, the description just got added recently? That's a new feature. Um, you can actually do posts now in your Google My Business. So and it um, they expire after I think a week, and you get a little email warning that your post is going to expire, and then you can put something else out, and you can put links or you can um, put a couple different call to actions on there. Um, so they're just expanding all the functionality within Google My Business, and it's a really big factor as far as you know, people finding you. So proximity of searcher to business. And this is something that's predicted to continue to be a really strong indicator. So somebody, when somebody is searching on a mobile phone, they they might just say, you know, find a dent, find a, I don't know, just find a coffee shop near me. So they're going to physically look at where that person is when they're searching and look at proximity, and that's a huge factor. So. You know, we can't look at things anymore just in terms of ranking. Well, you know, this coffee shop ranks number three and I rank number five or whatever, because it's going to change for every single search and every single situation and geographically it searches for where the searcher is actually at that moment. So user reviews is another really big thing. So if you're not getting reviews um, from your clients, customers, um, patients, whatever it is, um, that's something that you want to be working on. It is a factor, it's kind of, there's different schools of thought on how strong of a factor it is in the Google um, local path ranking itself, but then it's a huge factor in your click-through rate and your conversions. People actually like, you know, clicking on your link that looks like it's great because it's got, you know, the five stars up there, it says it's got, you know, 38 reviews when the other one only has two. So that kind of thing. So within your industry, look at your competitors and see how many reviews they have and how many you have and see, make sure that you are like at least on par or above the curve. So there's a lot of tools out there to help you ask for reviews. Um, there's one that I use with my clients called BirdEye and I'm sure all of you have gotten um, those emails after you've been in the business. They say, you know, were you happy? You know, would you like to leave us a review? And just having that automated follow-up is really effective. Um, I work with a lot of dentists, and I have one who's been using that for a couple of years, and he's got like 180 something reviews, which is unheard of. I mean, most dentists only have like, a, you know, a few, like a drop in the bucket. So it's you know really effective to actually just have that some kind of system that reaches out for you and makes those requests. So this was a quote from uh, Stephen Chen, who is a senior project manager at Google My Business. Um, so that 27% of people that look for local information are actually looking for reviews about that particular store. So when they're looking something up on Google search, that's what they found. 
because I'm a very large person and people ask what they want. Okay, so what do you do to optimize for all these new things? So first of all, follow the P is gone <laughs> on page, mm -hmm. best practices. Um, but, uh, you know, it's funny, I had some capitals in here, they had my son go through and take them out. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Um, okay, so they're on-page best practices. Those are still going to be essential, no matter what kind of query it is, whether it's voice, whether it's um, mobile, whether it's, you know, on a regular computer. You need that stuff no matter what. So make sure that you're on, your website is solid as far as your on-page, you know, best practices SEO. Uh, make sure that every page matters. You don't want to have um, duplicate pages that are just slightly different and don't really serve, one doesn't really serve a higher purpose over the other. Try, right. if you do have things like that, you can actually, um, you. <laughs> you can actually do, either remove the other page or if it needs to be there for some reason, you can do what's called canonical tags that redirect, you don't know, say, okay, well, this is the actual page that is intended to be indexed and ignore these other ones. Um, but you want every page to be useful and serve a unique purpose on your website. So using succinct, well-structured answers as part of long-form content. So where that's coming from is that there's been some studies that have shown that most of the answers that come up in the you know, Google Answers in the snippets are coming from pages with a lot of content. They're not coming from pages that just list a brief answer. But you near know, somewhere near the top of that content, they did answer the question very succinctly so you want to be clear and simple in you know, content that would be an answer to potential questions about your industry. At the same time, elaborating and having more content on that. So write simply. Again, this relates back to the accessibility talk we had last month. Um, you ninth grade reading level. You want to keep it simple. Those are the pages that are coming up the highest in search. Good, you know, easy read readability. Um, Using multimedia, especially video, but make sure that you're using descriptions with those. Google has not gotten to the point where it's listening to the sound of your video and picking out the words or looking at your images. Even though you know if you have like Pixel phone, you might it might group your images and say, oh, here's all your pet photos and here's all the people. And sure, Google can do that, but they're not doing it yet in search. And so your images, you want to have descriptions on those images, and your videos, you want to have transcriptions. So if you have somebody who's doing video, I have somebody right now who's starting to do a lot of video, and I'm like, this is great, this is going to bring so much traffic to your website, we're going to get those all transcribed, we're going to have the subtitles on the videos, we're going to reprint the transcription below the video, post that as a blog post, you know, have all that content is wonderful, and you don't have to write it, but make sure you're transcribing the videos, you don't, you know, throw away that content you've already created. Um, Optimize to increase click-through rate and reduce bounce rate. This goes back to user experience. So Google's actually looking at these things. So if you're, um, you get an impression in search, your page comes up as part of the search ranking. If people are clicking on your link and they're picking the one you know, below you, above you, and Google sees that, you have a poor click-through rate. So something about your title tag and your meta description tag are not telling the searcher that they're going to find what they want on your site. They're seeing the other results on the page and they're thinking that for some reason they like those ones better. So if you don't have a high, good click through rate, Google is actually going to start dropping your search ranking down lower. They won't because that's an indication to them that that page doesn't have what the, what the user wanted, right? And they want to give the users the best experience possible. Um, they're accordingly bounce rate. So bounce rate is when they do click on your link, but they get to your page and they immediately click right back. They hit the back button and move them right back on the search result and they're going to go somewhere else instead. So they track that as well. And again, it's an indication that the user did not find what they were looking for on your site. So that even carries into things like that your site is well designed, that it's aesthetically pleasing, that it's clean and organized and easy to find what they're looking for, that the, um, for instance, the title, your H1 tag, probably the title on your page is you know consistent with the H with the um, the title tag. See, like your page title and your title tag. Kind of two different things. You guys know what I'm referring to. 
Okay, but those are consistent because people see in the search results, they see the actual um, title tag, and then uh, if they, you know, get to the result and they don't see that, then they're going to um, feel like they're in the wrong place. So this was another quick quote. Let me just wrap up here. That um, Graphlingo analyzed 10,000 Google Home voice searches, and this is related to something I was just talking about. That content that ranks highly in desktop search also is very likely to appear as a voice search answer. In fact, approximately 75% of voice search results rank in the top three for that query in the regular organic searches. So in order to come up high in voice search, you need to do well in the regular organic searches. Um, I'm gonna post these slides. I wanna wrap up so that Anthea can get up here. I just made a quick checklist of um, technical aspects of SEO to keep in mind. Optimizing for page speed, pay attention to security, so we were talking about with HTTPS, and then also making sure that your WordPress um, you know, core and plugins are up to date. Using structured data, now will help you come up in some of those uh, feature snippets. And then internal linking, we talked a little bit about that, and then also results text, you make sure that nothing is being blocked that shouldn't be. Canonical tags, I mentioned those a little bit. Making sure that your content can be parsed as text, Again, anything that is not um, readable, like images, um, you know, flash, video, make sure you have text equivalent. 301 redirects, anytime that you remove a page, make sure that you put a redirect in there. If there's a similar page, if there's absolutely no page like on your site anymore, then it's okay to leave the 404 and let people know it's not to consider you anymore for that. Use one domain over multiple domains, and if you have, you know, if you're considering subdomains, subfolders is better. And then breadcrumbs, move on. Okay, this is kind of an introduction to Anthea because she's had a lot of success with um, content um, marketing with her website. Neil Patel is um, kind of, I don't know, a god in digital marketing, um, one of the top people out there. And this is a quote from him. He said, when I first got into the marketing industry about 10 years ago, it was all about technical SEO. <coughs> Today, it's all about content. Just look at the way content marketing industry has exploded. And so she's going to give you the examples from her website um, of how successful she's been in the content.